Have you ever wondered why it is harder for women in the workplace to become CEOs? A recent McKinsey and Company report surveyed 329 companies and employing more than 13 million people about women in the workplace. In 2019, women only made 21% of executives. You might also be wondering what this has to do with diversity, equity, and inclusion. That story illustrates what happens behind the scenes in the workplace with women of color of different backgrounds, how they navigate race and gender. My name is Rochelle Carrier and I'm a DEI consultant and for a living, I help thought-provoking leaders implement DEI plans in their workspace. And if you tune in, not only will you have a better insight of our shared experiences, it will also allow room for self-reflection. Firstly, the story I wanna share with you spans the entirety of my high school life and beyond where I was bullied, taunted, gaslit, and teased. And those were the early signs of microaggressions and racism that amplified themselves over the years. So you might ask, how would something like that shape you? After the murder of George Floyd, I gave myself permission to cry. And for weeks, I ultimately had to capture what had happened over the last 25 years. While, process, while processing and reflecting, I decided to create a space like this one here to share our intimate stories. Join us as we continue to discuss racism, sexism, DEI, and microaggressions aimed at women of color in corporate. Alan McGirt published an article in Fortune exploring why there are zero African-American women running Fortune 500 companies. This lack of female leadership is important to explore, but what are the experiences of women of color, brown or black, in the workplace before they make it to C-suite. So I wanted to find out how other women, generally women of diverse backgrounds, navigate, navigate the intertwined barriers at the intersection of race and gender. And only then did I begin to understand and unravel what was made to be felt like the other. So let's start with our thought-provoking question. On our forum is Keyshawn Hughes. She is an enthusiastic, intuitive neuro coach and helps anxious achievers, oh, that sounds like me, level up, <laughs> align with purpose, and feel healthy, fulfilled, aligned, and abundant. Keyshawn is an International Coaching Federation certified brain-based coach who specializes in neuroeducation, neuroentrepreneurship, neurohealth, neurospirituality, and neurorelationships. Keyshawn, welcome. Thank you. You're welcome. What was it like being the only one in the room? Oh my gosh. <laughs> As a neuro coach now, I'm so glad that I had the language to describe what I was feeling because I think that was part of the discomfort that I felt that I didn't have a name for. And so stressful, <laughs> to put it easily, I felt distressed to be the only. Um, throughout my 20 year career, I've worked in corporate spaces mostly. Now I'm on my entrepreneurship journey and consultant journey. But in those corporate spaces, I worked with a lot of people who did not look like me, mostly white men. And while they were kind <laughs> and supportive in many ways, on a day-to-day -day basis, I could say I felt extremely lonely. And what I found and what I've learned about the brain is that when you are alone or when you feel alone, it registers as physical pain. It's in the same portion of our brain that registers physical pain. So a lot of the times I was in a stress response. We hear about fight, flight, freeze. Mine, my go-to is typically freeze. And so I felt a lot of times paralyzed. I felt a lot of times where I wasn't able to use my voice, where I had a lump in my throat, um, where I just felt like deer in the headlights when called upon. 
just kind of like now. I didn't realize I was going to go first, but I'm able to work through that now. I know how to manage my breathing. I know how to ground myself and calm myself. But for so many years, I didn't. And of course, themes of imposter syndrome come up, themes of not feeling like enough, perfectionism, hypervigilance, overworking. All of those things are a part of my story and my journey. And so I totally empathize with those who are still in that experience. Like myself, I, I call myself an anxious achiever and I've been able to overcome and have breakthroughs. And now I just have dedicated my life to supporting other people like me in that in that realm. And I know we can we can break through anything, especially once we have the language and the practical tools to do that and the support, the community. So thank you for this stage and opportunity to have community today. Oh, you're welcome. You know, I wouldn't mind you sharing. You said you mentioned that you had that the brain registers it as physical pain. Yes. Yes. So yes. when you're going through this physical pain, so you legitimately break down. Oh, absolutely. And it erodes yeah. your personality, your behavior, everything. It's just eroding. Particularly your health your health is number one. So in order to be able to show up as our best selves in our personal and professional lives, it helps when we're healthy, right? But when you're in a constant state of distress, say you're at work for eight hours a day and you're in that stress state, that has a direct connection to the state of your health. And weeks, months, years of being in that state, at one point, I had a burnout experience more than once, actually, I'm sad to say, because it was extremely traumatizing and, and horrible and it felt really bad. Um, and I wouldn't want to wish that on anybody. But more people are experiencing that now in the workplace than ever before and ever in history because of the pandemic and all of the spaces that we're in now. And so absolutely, burnout is a physical, emotional, mental exhaustion state, along with some other medical factors that go along with that. And so, yes, when you're in that state, when your brain registers that pain, there is a direct association to other parts of your body that are in pain as well. That It's amazing how you, you mentioned burnout, because that's something I went through myself now that you're sharing, I'm sharing as well. Mm -hmm. And back in February, it was recently, and I you don't recognize it as a burnout, you think right. it's family life, you think it's work, you think it's stress, I can't handle the meeting, or you think it's a learning curve. Yeah. And I think generally as women, we think it's something else. Always. Yes, Always. right? I, no. I see everybody <laughs> shaking their head. So you think of it as something else. You know, what did I do? Yeah. And, and then until you go through that process, and actually it was only when I called the doctor and she said, you need time out. Absolutely. And I thought, what's time out? I'm a mom, I'm a wife, I'm, what is time out? There's no such thing as time out. And then when I realized the time out was, okay, I had to force myself to lie down, force myself to relax, mm -hmm. force myself to delegate. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like you said, bring in your support system. But thank you for sharing. Thank you. You're welcome. Jeannie Chang is a licensed marriage and family therapist and founder of Your Change Provider PLLC. It is an interdisciplinary practice founded on solutions and her unique framework, cultural confidence. Her first book, A is for Authentic, I like this, not for anxieties, or straight A's, mm -hmm. and is a number one international bestseller on Amazon. Jeannie, we actually did a Women Who Boss Up Summit live a few weeks ago, and you had mentioned that you were of Korean descent and how it was hard for you to accept your Korean culture. So what was it like being the only one in the room and how did you overcome it? It's like a loaded question, right? So, so you have the thing, just like Kishan did. Okay, how do I answer this as briefly as possible? I am still dealing with being the only one in the room, even though there are more people in the room that look like me. Let me share. In my field, I am talking about mental health, Asian mental health, BIPOC mental health, and I'm talking about stigma and navigating through that so when I say being uh, alone in the room, it's also trailblazing 
it's not just leadership, but doing things that perhaps uh, I'm not saying others aren't doing, but I'm speaking out in corporate America and I'm not speaking against or, you know, calling people out. I'm trying to call them what I say, calling them in, calling them forward to be taking care of themselves. So it's about mental health, but then yet you, you hit this wall. So every day in my work, I have to reset. I love that Keyshawn mentioned grounding tools. Mindfulness is a big part of my practice mm -hmm. and reminding myself that years ago, the identity that I struggled with, my very identity that I'm proud of today, it's come full circle because growing up, yes, I, I hate is probably a strong word, but let's put it this way because I treat a lot of adolescents, parents, families that struggle with being Asian, the internalized racism, right? That angst within going, yeah, I'm not so, I'm not so keen on my culture because I want to fit in. I want to conform. And, and we, we, we speak differently now being older, but when you're younger or even depending on the age you're at or, or even in a boardroom, you do find yourself conforming because of things that you, you know, you don't want to stand out or you don't want to be alone. Yeah. I was alone a lot of the times because I'd be like, that doesn't, can I, can I say something that doesn't make sense? Um, being the only Asian or being the only Asian that would speak out. Yes. So despite the fact that I love being a second generation Korean American, which means I was basically raised here. I was born in Seoul, but literally came when I was a baby. So pretty, pretty much born and raised identifying with being American, but loving being Korean, but it takes a lot of work each day to say, okay, let's let me not conform i i want to showcase my korean culture and bring it out to the world and really what what's the word diversify you know you know um create this equitable experience and environment through the lens of mental health and then include everyone because i felt so excluded so much of my life so i'll pause there great when you say you felt excluded and like Keishon mentioned as well, you felt excluded and lonely. Mm -hmm. What did you, and you said you're still going through the process, even though there are more people who look like you, what are you doing to overcome it now that you're aware? Because like you said, we've become older and yeah. I'm aware and I have a daughter, so I'm aware of what she does and it's the smallest things with her hair, you know, how yeah. she wants to flatten it, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, and she doesn't want it puffy. Yeah. So oh. I'm going through the process as we do this live. <laughs> and yeah. it's, it's not an easy process, but I'm aware. So you're aware, but what are you doing to overcome it? And I, so I'm going to rephrase that just because I like to reframe things. As a clinician, you know, having a clinical lens at times, I don't always say overcome because I want to be clear that it's an identity. An identity is a journey. It's an ever evolving journey. So we are constantly navigating, uh, you know, literally till our physical death. So yes. I always tell people that it's a circular, circular yes. causality. Um, it's a very fa family systemic term. That's why I'm a family yes. therapist. But I love that in circles, that's how I see things. Nothing in mental health is linear, right? So everything's causing the other thing at A, B, B, C everywhere. So there are times that even now, even though I'm proud, I, I, there are, I shy depending on the environment I'm in. I'm like, Oh, do you need to check myself? Wait a second. Okay. Why am I struggling? So I never say, let me overcome this. Let me be this person. It's more like, Hey, why am I, why am I switching gears? Why does imposter syndrome come out in this one instance or when I'm speaking out to this organization? And then I'm going to share this. I tend to deal with a lot more sexism in the Asian community Ugh. than racism. I'm, that's just my honest uh, experience because it's very patriarchal culture. Yes. And there are times when in my own, amongst my own people, and I shared this at the Boss Up Summit, and I got emotional because they're mm -hmm. your own people, right? So you're always like, hey, we're together. Not necessarily, not always. And I'm talking about mental health. And I'm talking about stigma and breaking through it and, and stop being silent, talking about our well-being when people are like, oh, uh, mm, I'm good, right? The perfectionism that we talked about. Well, I do feel lonely in that sense when I'm, silenced in my own community. So when I say sexism uh, amongst Asian males, they see me as, oh, Jeannie, oh gosh, you know, how do we quiet her? I even see their face when I speak up because I'm like, they're going to probably think I'm going to say something. I'm not talking about them. I'm talking about things in general. But what I get a lot is we need to silence Jeannie. And sure, they've never said that, but I read between the lines using my Korean nunchi, 
that's this term, nunchi, <laughs> eye measure, reading between the room. But that that's very lonely too, when yeah. I get hurt by fellow Asian Americans. And I'm being very honest about that. Yeah. So it's hard. So it's a constant process of the identity in a circle. And I feel like every day it's a reset. And that's just how I see myself. Oh, that's good. Yeah. You know, um, I think we should probably, you're, I have so many stories <laughs> and I think, yeah, there's, um, I have to process it as we're doing this live mm -hmm. yeah. because it's bringing up emotions and a lot of stories. Yeah. So I'm going to move to the next person so I can. <sighs> Good. Take a breath. Take a breath. Take a breath. Yeah. Take a breath. Thank you for sharing this. Yeah. So for everyone who might not know, Medea has finished her master's degree in human resources development and recently started at, as a DEI advisor, thank you, <laughs> at Crescendo. And if you can tell us, and I know we had a discussion, Medea, about this, and you had actually imparted a lot of information to me that I didn't even know of. So what was it like for you or what is it still like for you to be the only one in the room? So if you can give us a background, we'll welcome it. Yeah, for sure. Um, and yeah, my name is Maida, by the way. I always like to go with Maida Force Be With You as a reminder. <laughs> and yeah, no worries. But um, yeah, this is a, a very much complicated question for me because my background is that I am uh, Indonesian, but I grew up in Singapore and then I've been in the US for seven years and I'm returning to Singapore, but you may not remember all of that. But um, I've always been the only one in the room when I was in Singapore. I was always known as Indonesian because my name was pretty obvious. And so even though I am Chinese looking and most of the folks in Singapore are Chinese, um, I was never really, you know, I never belong in part of a group and they will always kind of um, mention, uh, you know, or like remind me every day that I'm not um, Singaporean. And so, and I, I know that it, it is kind of similar to the Asian American identity of being a perpetual foreigner in your own home. Mm -hmm. And when I came to the US, um, the complications came in where the Indonesians would kind of go, you're Singaporean. And then the Singaporeans would go, you're Indonesian. And then Americans would kind of be like, wow, your English is so good. So there's just so many things that hit me all at once. And as I mentioned, like um, trying to relate to the Asian American experience is also not easy because I didn't like grow up here. I didn't go to high school here. And I know a lot of folks have like different experiences as when they were younger. Um, so I've always, I, I like to use the word othering in terms of what I've like experienced. Um, but I, I feel like I've always, I'm always um, the only one in the room. Like even in my current company, my colleagues are all in Canada, but I'm the only one in the US and I'll be in Singapore. And um, but it's great because we all embrace our diversity and, and, and I'm, I'm kind of like the uh, in a good way, like the token global perspective for them. So, yeah. So, so that's my story with regards to that question. And is it you still feel that because you're in Minneapolis, correct? Yes. Yep. Yeah. So how is it? being in Minneapolis, I mean, you were you were doing your graduate degree and what were the emotions that you that you went through? I know people are pointing things out to you, but what's your mental process? Like, what is it that you go through? Yeah, it is definitely I'm still in the process of it, for sure, in terms of like accepting that we're all unique in, in our own ways. And, and one of the it could be a quote somewhere and it could be something that I'm making up, but I, I feel like we all want to be unique individuals, but we also want to belong, right? We also want to be part of a bigger group. We also want to, you know, feel like we can relate to other folks in, in that sense. But it is really um, like difficult. And I, I still don't feel like there are folks that I can immediately go to if let's say I do experience something to kind of go, hey, like, or, or like, can you believe this happened? And um, right now, that's not something that that kind of like community or circle is not something that I have. And I'm always seeking for, for that community. And that support. And this is yeah. what Jeannie mentioned. This is what Keyshawn mentioned. It's it's still that, that sense of feeling alone. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. It's the sense of feeling alone. Mm -hmm. So I applaud you for doing everything that you're you're doing. Thank you so much. I know it's a process for for everybody. And I'd like to sh I'd like to introduce you to the next guest, Martine Cadet is the founder and owner of Cadric Media LLC, <laughs> a boutique digital media agency supporting small business owners, women, you're all business owners here, <laughs> brand themselves online and expand their visibility. After I actually had a brief conversation with you, Maltzine, I had brief conversations with everybody, but I also had a special one with Maltzine. And she had you had you had mentioned your past career in corporate America, and I thought of you particularly because it reminded me of what you went through and how you were the only one in that room with that particular situation that you had mentioned to me. You had you know worked for, and I'll let you take it away from here. Yes, yes. Thank you so much, Rachel. Um, ah. Let me just tell you, this is such a refreshing space. Um, it, it, it is definitely a topic that I've been longing to be able to speak out about as much as, you know, I can find the opportunity. So thank you for this. Uh, so I, I kind of went through that same journey that I, I apologize the name, but uh, where I, I grew up outside of the United States. I grew up in Haiti. Part of my life, I grew up in Africa. I've traveled the world since I was a baby. So I'm very, very, uh, you know, aware of what's out there in the world. And so when I came in the United States, I did not understand what racism was, to be honest with you. I didn't even, I hadn't encountered it until I got myself into corporate America. Uh, I was the only one in the room. Uh, and when I wasn't the only one in the room, the other people that were in the room with me that looked like me were not doing what I was doing. And I did not understand that. So I was the one getting booked to fly to China, uh, you know, five-star hotel and going to Hong Kong for my job. Yet I'm walking the hallways of this corporate America job and looking at the other ones like me with looking at me in a different way saying why are you doing that and i'm not mm -hmm. and that is, that's when my identity journey started and i realized that okay there's a lot going on with me not only do i look like this i have the natural hair i'm not and just like you mentioned rochelle the whole process of now with your daughter i have a daughter i've been through it all with her she's 15 now now she embraced her curls but all that to say i said you know what i'm not going to change i'm haitian i speak french i have a background i have an education yes you are here in the mail room that doesn't mean you cannot go to hong kong either it means that you need to step up to the game it means that you need to embrace who you are and that's exactly what i did and i embraced my curls i was the only one in the room but i was loud uh you could not not see me with the big curly hair uh, you could not not see me you know speaking with my accent and i spoke up and for the other ones that were in the room with me that looked like me that were in the position like me ended up questioning their identity because they realized that they did not sound like themselves. And next thing you know, braided hairs were coming in the room as well. Curly hairs were coming in the room as well. And I said, all right, sister, let's do this. Enough with trying to press your hair, enough with trying to be like them. Be you, you're beautiful the way you are. And that is why I do what I do today with online marketing, where I help my women understand that you're enough. What you have is enough. The way you look is enough. Don't get discouraged and tempted to think that you have to wear the Gucci, the pressing hair, the, you know, all of that just to be seen. Your voice is enough. And so I've been through a lot. I know that there's more to come. I'm excited about it. And um, just being here alone is giving me so much, uh, you know, motivation and boost to keep showing up. And so that's my story, being the only one in the room, the Haitian girl with the French accent and just saying, listen, I'm smart. I know what I'm talking about. Yes, I know what an offset umbrella is, even though I didn't have one in Haiti. I can speak to it because I learn and I step up and I educate myself and I and I show up. Yeah, you show up. So what is it that you're imparting to your, or what have you imparted or probably continue imparting to your daughter? 
oh my goodness, she's heading to college in two years. And just over the weekend, we had, uh, I was braiding her hair. Now I know how to braid hair. Uh, <laughs> listen, the pandemic taught me a lot. Um, and she is embracing her natural hair. That was the biggest, and her skin. So mm. many people are like, oh my God, the, the, your skin, your skin. She's like, mom, why are so many people are complimenting my skin? I said, because it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful. Embrace it. And so she is definitely, she told me, she's like, I am not pressing my hair. Every now and then we blow dry. I do it too. But she loves her curls. Um, she's constantly showing me new products. And she's like, she's really loving who she is. And I'm like, go for it. This is who you are. Uh, don't change. This is you. That's it. And it, it's interesting how you said this is enough. I have affirmations. I'm so guilty of saying affirmations in the morning. I have five reminders and that's one of them. I am enough. And in the Boss Up Summit, there was, I remember Tam, if I, I please correct me if I'm wrong. It, it is Tam, right? Yes. And she had said something about showing, it doesn't have to be perfect, but 70% you're there and then 30%, did I do my math right? Yeah, <laughs> is when you're actually, is the part that you're working at. So as long as you show up, that's enough. So I'm, I'm happy you, you said that. So I'm definitely going to now introduce Natalie Lee Martin, who is a dynamic, inspiring and creative leader and speaker. She has published three books during the pandemic and one of which has become Amazon's number one new release. <laughs> what was it like being the only one in the room, if you ever experienced being the only one in the room? And I remember Jeannie was saying, you know, you don't actually overcome it. So I'm going to rephrase my questioning. Thank you, Jeannie. <laughs> I know it's a journey because it's my first time here. So I am, I'm, I'm welcoming all the information. So how is it like for you, Natalie, being the only one in the room, if you were? And I also had a private conversation with you. So please share how it was like and how you felt. So um, I also am not African-American. I am from Trinidad, Trinidad. So I'm a Trinidadian born and moved to the States when I was about five years old. And so having to navigate through that experience and I didn't experience racism per se from um, the Caucasian culture, but from the African-American culture. So it was just like, your accent is different. You you eat different foods. And I, I was always made fun of. So I tried my best to suppress that side of me. And then I ended up moving back to Trinidad for a few years. And then I got it on that end. They were like, you're American, you have an accent. And so I was always, you know, the one that never fit in. And even in college, I was a math major. Um, I remember being the only African-American female in the classes and the boys would look at me like, what is she doing here? Mm -hmm. I remember in one networking, cause I did computer science and math. I had, um, it was just a group of white males and, and there were some, um, I think there were a couple of Indian and, you know, a lot of Asian males in there. And I was the only um, black female. And I mean, when they, when it was time to put the groups together, no one wanted to be in my group, but I was, I took it and I said, you know what? I got to work a little bit harder. I got to work a lot harder. I'm not proving myself to them, but I'm proving myself to me that I know that I can um, step up and be the, you know, the best or um, just on the same level playing field as them. And so I got an A in that class. And when they found out I had an A in that class, they were all like, we were partnering with the wrong person. Yes, you were. <laughs> but, <laughs> and the professor shouted me out and everything. And I was just like, it was just a, just an honor for me to realize like, I can do this. I can do this. And so there was a transition that came. My husband's in the military. And every time I, I entered into a new room, I always was the girl that was looking for someone that looked like me. So I was always like, where are the other minority females? Where are they? I need to you know, connect with them. And we ended up going to Japan. And in Japan, it is the Americans versus the Japanese. <laughs> so it was like the Americans, we are now the minority in Japan. So it was just like, okay, I have to connect with people 
And if we are the minority, I can't just say, oh, I'm just going to look for the women of color. I'm just looking for other Americans so that I can stay connected. Because it was, you know, um, the, the base wasn't really that big. It was a small community. You, you practically knew every single person on the base. So if you decided to just connect with people of color, you would only be connecting with about 10% of the base. And at that point in my life, going through my transition, I started realizing a lot of the people of color didn't always think like me. So mm -hmm. if I really wanted to connect with people like me, it would probably be 1% of the base. Wow. So I said, you know what? I have to diversify my options. I have to reach out to people that have the same heart as me, as opposed to who look like me. And so I end up connecting with a few other females. And let me tell you, it wasn't always an easy, um, it wasn't easy because now I have to look outside of the obvious things that we are connected to and really um, dig deep into who they were as a person. And a friend of mine, we got really close. Um, she, uh, Trayvon Martin, that whole experience happened while I was in Japan. And I was like, the way you talk about George Floyd, that's how I felt during that Trayvon Martin, because I had young black boys. And she and I were talking and she brought up the fact that Trayvon shouldn't have been there, um, that he shouldn't have had a hoodie on. And she's going on and on and she's talking to me and I'm like, I'm a black woman. You're talking to me about a young black boy. Why would you do this? And so I just like, OK, what do I do in this moment? I love this girl. I love this woman. She obviously doesn't understand the pain that we are going through over this situation. And I just said, stop. Think about my babies. She, mm -hmm. she was one of my good friends. Like she watched my boys. She took care of my boys. She took them to school. She brought them home. I said, what if my son was in that predicament? What would you say? Empathy. And she was just like, well, Natalie, your son wouldn't do that. I was like, we don't know what he did we don't know what the situation is he was walking down the street with a bag of skittles and some iced tea my son goes to the store he walks down the street with a bag of skittles and some iced tea what would you say if it was my son and in that moment i could see her face like she changed her yeah. whole appearance her face changed and that's when the light bulb went out in my head and i was like I have to touch these people's hearts because they, some people just do not have black friends. Some people just do not have Korean friends. Some people just have never been in a home with someone who was Caribbean. So obviously they're gonna have these stereotypes. And if I have to be the only one in the room so that I can shut all that down so that the other girls that are coming behind me don't have to deal with it, then so be it. So now my mindset is if I'm the only one in the room, let's get it. This is a platform for me, my race, my gender, the fact that I'm from Trinidad, this is my platform. And I use it wherever I go to let people know this is who I am and this is what people like me, who look like me, can do. And so that's just how I use mine. That's how I feel about being the only one in the room. I love it when I see my women of color, but if I'm the only one, that's okay. Let's get it. Because if I open the door, then I'm bringing all my sisters with me. We are all going together. I love y'all. <laughs> That was so good. I was gonna say we need more emojis because I've been trying to find oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh goodness me. This is amazing. You know what? It's interesting. There's I, I'm I'm taking from everything that everybody has said and embracing, you know, embracing your culture, embracing who you are, being enough and that it's okay being the only one in the room and going through this journey. And as it's a constant process that we're all going through. And it's it's interesting because I think it, it was Medea. I, we had a conversation and it was interesting because you said something that triggered something in me. And you had mentioned a... Um, a V E. <laughs> yes. Thank you for filling in the blank. That's exactly it. Can you share with the audience what that means? And then I can share a story as well. Yeah, for sure. I'm, I'm sure other folks in the room have can better explain it for um, what that is. But A A V or B V E 
African American vernacular English or Black vernacular English. I kind of mentioned that because uh, I was talking about how in Singapore we have a Singlish accent. Our first language is English, so I kind of brought that up um, as a kind of like a concept or topic for Rachel and I to kind of um, chat with. But um, BVE is basically the way that Black folks uh, talk, and, and you know, it's sometimes coded as um, street talk or and it's not professional and and how that is not um acceptable in the workplace and things like that and that definitely brings barriers and gatekeeping and all that kind of stuff in the workplace and uh feel free for uh, other folks to chime in on that as well but i brought it up because of the the singlish aspect of it right and latonya i'm going to introduce you next i saw you shaking your head so i want you to take on this one too so latonya davis is a speaker and founder of k12 tanya davis she shifts people with good intent to exceptional right. impact that leads to racial equity joy and achievements in joy. schools joy. organizations and companies what was it like being the only one in the room? Uh, first off, this is a wonderful platform. Uh, I'm going to say, number one, I would say do it afraid. I'm going to start off with that. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, I'm a lawyer. I've always had the mouth. I've always had um, the ideas that may have been different from other people. But I do think it's necessary for people to really recognize uh, what women, what women of color, what black women, what natural hair women can bring to the table. Uh, for me, my experience um, actually uh, sort of began, I can say it really, really uh, impacted me when I was in places where you're walking around and people assume that I actually worked at the store uh, to get clothes. And I think people can kind of understand that. <laughs> I think the other thing that was very interesting was being in law school, one of the eight African-Americans, <laughs> right, in the class. And actually having, usually in law school, you get you brief cases. So you read all these books, these cases, and you stand up and you brief. But this particular day, um, my white professor decided he wanted to have me stand like the entire time, briefing cases, throwing all these hypotheticals at me. So I stood there, responded, did my thing. And I remember my colleagues came up to me afterwards and they were like, wow, we can't believe you did that, X, Y, and Z. In my mind at the time, I was just like, you know what? I'm just as equal to everybody else in this room. I have a voice, I want to speak, I want to do my thing. And so that was my first experience recognizing what was happening. The other thing I thought that was interesting was when everyone was able to go to uh, this professor's uh, office to get help, I walk in and I'm just like, hey, I'm here like everybody else. He said to me, it's okay, Ms. Davis, if you get a C. And I said, first of all, I pay your salary. So I'm not sure who you think you're speaking to, but at the end of the day, your job is to make sure that you're doing the same thing for me as you do everyone else. Mm -hmm. So I think one of the things we have to think about is just sometimes it's almost like uh, th there's the expectation that I'm going to be treated differently, one, because of my skin color, mm -hmm. because you don't know anything else about me. And so I think that's the thing that people need to recognize is that's what needs to really stop. Yes. <laughs> whatever, whatever the difference is you see, don't look at it as a difference. Think of it as an opportunity to get to know someone and build a relationship, and then you move from there. So I think the the only other experience I can really speak about is, number one, my perspective is very different. One, because I'm a mother of a neurodiverse child with autism, and I'm raising him as a world changer. So I want this world to be very different for him so that he understands this is what my mommy did to make sure that I was in place to receive the equity that's needed. I think the second thing is I'm a graduate of Jackie Yates Senior High School uh, and also Bennett College, which is a black women's college for women. But specifically, what is interesting about Yates is that we are a well-known school in the city of Houston. It is also the school that George Floyd graduated from, and he was friends with my brother. So that shifted my perspective in terms of what I wanted to do and using my voice. So the latest, in, I'm going to say the latest and greatest drama <laughs> with that would be in one space. Uh, I did have to deal with some microaggressions and some racial trauma with an individual who was a female. Uh, very interestingly enough, I was hired to do anti-racist work, mm -hmm. which I was excited about. But what ended up happening was some several conversations and things happened like, oh, you're not here to make any changes. You're not here to talk about race. Oh, I study critical race theory, so I know. And I thought to myself, do you recognize who you're actually talking to? Clearly you don't. You don't have context. You don't have understanding. So in situations like that, you know, of course, I'm going to speak and advocate and say what I think is necessary. And I'm going to still do what I need to do. But what I'm not going to do is allow someone to speak to me in any sort of way and to not understand that what they have said, their behavior and their thoughts 
are the reason why we need to continue to have the DEIB. Whichever one you're, whichever one you're lacking, <laughs> that's the one that needs to grow. So I think that's the thing that I think that people need to really recognize is that the individual conversations one on one is super, super important. So whether I'm training, you know, this uh, company over here to develop an anti-racist product, which I've done, whether I'm over here with the school setting, helping you to understand how to write curriculums that are anti-racist because it's not something new, it's something that's been going on for a long time. Everyone should be doing it. Whatever that is, it's necessary for people to realize that even though I might be the only one in the room, my voice matters, my perspective matters, and my history matters. And so I'm going to continue to do those things to make sure that not only my son, but other people do not have those experiences that I had to experience as well. I, I agree with, with, with everything you've said. It's interesting how, you know, I was, I, I was coming into, you, you keep mentioning a voice. And when I resigned from teaching after 25 years in February, I realized, and it's exactly what you said, I belong here, I am here, and I'm going to use my voice in a way that serves others. Right. And no one can silence me anymore because I'm in the classroom. Right. And, and then there's, you know, there's a certain thing that happens in the classroom as well. You know, you're in the classroom, you're being micromanaged, you know, there's a little bit of aggression because I was always, like all of you, always the only one in the room, always the only one in the, in, you know, religious schools, charter schools, public schools, private schools. And I was always the token. So it's interesting that you said that. And I think you, it sounds like there was a support system. You know, I have an interesting story. I worked at, um, at Yeshiva for one year, an all, a, a all boys school. Yep. And um, my class was a grade six class. And I remember being, you know, turning around and writing my notes on the whiteboard. And then a little boy said, nigger. And then I thought, hmm. So I turned around and I said, you need to kind of leave my classroom and go to the principal's office. So now the class became red, quiet, and no one knew what to do with themselves. And it's funny when you say shut down, Keyshawn, I shut down yeah. and I didn't know how to address it. I mean, I had been called that before, right. but this was different. Yeah. And it, it was very vocal and yeah. it was, I was right there in front of, I was, it was me, it was me. There was nobody else, it was me. So the support or the lack of that I received was very interesting because when I did approach it to um, the rabbis, I said, this is what happened and this is why he's there. And they started whispering. I was at the bus uh, at the, um, you know, when you go downstairs and you're waiting for all the, 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 the lineup where all the parents come and pick up their kids. And he whispered in my ear, he's like, don't worry about it, it will go away. And I thought, it will go away. That took another level of shutdown. <laughs> and I thought, what's gonna go away? And then it was a process, it took a couple days, it was a process. I'm gonna go away, the color's gonna go away. I'm gonna, you, you know, who, who are you talking to? But that mental shutdown, like you said, I froze. And they said, okay, well, he is going to now be suspended for an X amount of days. And um, when he returns, I'll have him write an apology letter. And I thought, but what does that learn? What does that teach him? An apology letter? You know, an apology letter to say, I'm sorry. But if that's what you really feel, you're not sorry about what you feel. If that's how you felt, because that's what you said. So it's, it was, it was a constant, and this just happened two years ago. So this was, this was something that, and this is why I'm here because those things, I am not that person anymore. I don't want to be silenced anymore. I'm using this voice and using this platform for all of you so we could share everything that we've been through. So people know exactly what's going on and it's not a space 
to be upset or angry or irritated, but it's a space to share. And I think by sharing all these stories, we realize that it's happened to all of us at one point or another. You know, we've we've embraced it, maybe. And then sometimes we didn't, I didn't embrace it at that time, I froze. So, and then I look back and then I think, well, this is not a place for me. I need to go to a place where I still might be the only one, but I need to use my voice. I not, not have that frog in my throat when someone says that and make them realize, who are you really talking to? You know, so thank you, Latanya, for, for, for sharing and everybody else. Sheena, yep. I had a great conversation with her as well. And we also met on the Women Who Boss Up Summit. She's a keynote speaker, coach, podcaster, and author on building confidence. Her award-winning podcast called The Tao of Self-Confidence, where she interviews Asian women boost their inner confidence. So I want this question to you. I'm asking you this question as well. What was it like being the only one in the room? Hey, Michelle, thanks so much for having me. I'm so excited to be in this panel today with all the other ladies and some familiar faces like Natalie and Jeannie. And yeah, for me, growing up wasn't really easy, right? Especially being the only one in the room. I remember growing up not being able to see any Asian female role models to look up to, I always felt like I wasn't enough. And even in the workplace, when you have men telling you their worth, it really stops us from going out there uh, and doing things that we wanted to do. I remember one time when I wanted to apply for another job because I wanted to make more money and do something that was more challenging. One of my male coworkers was like, well, why would you go look for another job? You make more than enough as a woman. And that really stopped me from looking for another job and stayed at my office job for 12 years. And, you know, being the only one doesn't necessarily mean being the only one with men. Sometimes it was also with other women, right? Other women being catty to you, getting jealous of you, and, you know, just talking about you. It was really hard for me at the time because I was like, I didn't really do anything to these women. I did my work, yet you know, they still had this jealousy, right? And it, you know, I think this is something that's not talked about because we really need to learn to work together, especially with the problems that's been going on. The pandemic has really affected women way more than men, even more so women of color. And in order for us to solve these problems, we have to stop being catty with each other and learn to collaborate, to connect and collaborate to solve these problems. And so uh, I know as women, we, we face a huge confidence gap from men, right? If we wanted to go for that promotion, we would over prepare to a T, but something holds us back, right? While a man, he may be 20% ready, he'll go for it regardless of the outcome. And, you know, once he gets a yes, he doesn't even know what he's going to do. He's just going to figure it out along the way. And as women, we tend to overthink everything, right? I'm guilty of it. I overthink all the time or I procrastinate or, you know, I'm afraid to make a decision based on my upbringing, especially as Asian women, right? We've been told what to do all our lives. You know, we're told to live one way of life and never rock the boat. And anything you do outside of that is considered shameful. So, you know, when my parents came here, they just wanted a better life for me, but they thought a better life was to go apply for a job and work there until you're 60. I personally could not see myself sitting in a cubicle until I was 60. Like, I couldn't see myself going in day in and day out. Not that I'm saying having a job is bad if you love your job that's great. I know there's also a lot of people who are going through so much because of their job, especially in the pandemic, working from home, your mental health has gone up to a T, your stress and anxiety levels have uh, increased because, you know, we feel like we're trapped in our own homes, which is really crazy. And so this is why I'm so passionate about talking about these topics, helping women build their confidence, uh, being open about mental health, because we all go through it, right? I mean, I know in every culture, mental health is a stigma. You know, it's not, we're not allowed to talk about it. If we talk about it, we're, we're considered crazy. Like, especially with the Asian culture, right? It's either they avoid it, they don't bring it up, or they do the exact opposite and put you into like a mental institute. They just don't want to deal with it, right? Sometimes some people will say things like, mental health isn't real. I'm like, what are you talking about? We all go through it. And so the more we're open about these things and the more vulnerable we are in sharing our stories and some of the challenges we've been through, the more we can relate to one another and realize that we're not the only ones who go through this. It was one of the reasons why I created my podcast, because one thing, I just didn't see enough representation out there, 
especially for Asian women. And so I always tell myself, if I have to be that person to create it, I'll go ahead and do it. And sometimes that's what happens when you're the only one, when you're sick and tired of not seeing the change you want, you have to go out there and do it and make that first move. And I know it's not always easy for a woman to make their first move, right? Because then, then we're labeled as you're too aggressive, you're too pushy, you're too, like, there's so many labels, right? We can go on and on about that. But we got to do something, right? If someone says I'm too pushy or aggressive, that's fine. As long as I can create the positive impact. One day, they won't see women as pushy and aggressive. They'll see them as confident and courageous and bold, right? Doing things, you know, that's not typical. And and sometimes, you know, this isn't an easy journey, right? Because life is like a roller coaster. Sometimes, you know, we're 100% confident. Sometimes we're 0% confident. But learning to work on it every single day will help it along the way. And also just surrounding yourself with like-minded women is so important. We don't have to do this alone. It's okay to ask for help, right? Especially now in this time of the pandemic, one thing that women crave for is support, but we're so afraid to ask for it because it feels like we're not, we're weak or we're asking for a hand up, but really we're not, you know, we're just asking someone to help us to get through our journeys, right? To help us maybe speed up when it comes to building confidence or going out there, um, you know, building a business or whatever it may be. And I know it's not easy because I've been there too. Like I would have to second guess myself all the time. Like, am I doing the right thing? Is this something that I want to do? What if I'm bothering them? But I'm like, you know, what, instead of thinking, what's the worst that could happen? What's the best thing that could happen, right? Maybe we end up collaborating on something. Maybe we end up you know, I meet up, meet this person because of this other person. Like, sky's the limit, right? And we have to learn to even, like, as women, we're, we're so afraid to ask questions, right? Um, I remember one time at my job um, when I was doing uh, salary negotiations. So in, in Chinese culture, anything that ends with a four is, is bad, right? Because if you say number four in Chinese, it means death as well, just based on the um, pronunciation. So at the time, let's say, you know, my boss was like, well, I'm going to raise your your salary from 50000 to 54000 And I actually told him, is it okay if you add another thousand? Because in my culture, the number four is bad. And at first, he actually laughed at me because he probably thought it was really ridiculous. But I was being serious. I'm like, no, like, this is the thing, right? Like, if you go to Chinese people's houses, none of them have a four because it's a bad omen. Uh, but eventually, he gave it to me because I asked for it. And so... The, the importance of that is just learning to ask, because if you never ask, the answer is always no. So, yeah. <laughs> I, I I agree with you. It's interesting that the, um, you know, what's, what's, what's interesting about this, this platform is that how much the diversity actually brings us together in, yeah, in a way that you, I'm actually learning right now as we speak. And I was brought up in Montreal in a very diverse community. And today, right now, I am still learning some things about each and every one of your backgrounds. And I'm Haitian, and I was learning something about Martin, and which which resonated with me. And then, you know, I learned something about Latanya. And it's interesting, Sheena, how you said that it's You know, it 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 allows you to share an experience and to understand the other person and to understand where the other person comes from. He laughed because he didn't know, and then by a and then by you being you know forthright, what's like no, it's it's a bad omen. You know, if you go to China, and then you're you were adamant about you know voicing what your fear was, but you also asked for it. And I think that's what's important. And that's that's there's so many other topics we're going to touch in the next couple of months. But salary negotiation is a big one. Huge. Yes, I know. It's huge. And it's it's like you said, if you don't ask, it'll be a no. So until you ask and until you know your worth, that's what it comes down to. You have to know your worth. I am enough. I am worth it. So he did give you, he did give it to you because you weren't backing down, you know? So it's, it's, it's an amazing, I'm so happy that we had these courageous conversations 
we were brave and forthright and we we you know shared our voices so my keynote is that while trying to limit my own bias as much as possible by interviewing only women who i did not know really i didn't know any of you and sticking to the same set of questions for ongoing interviews which we'll do together in the future it was impossible to completely remove my own personal experience as you saw from from the discussion so without it i wouldn't have been able to undertake it in the first place so the continual theme you know, surface that if true equality in the workplace is what we are after, sooner or later, we will tackle the issues that are distinctive to us, and especially in the workplace. So this was our very first groundbreaking episode of how women of diverse backgrounds describe navigating race and gender in the workplace. I know many of you Thank you for all the comments and all the chats. I know many of you are having transparent and courageous dialogues as we speak with the people around you, and you're trying to figure out how you feel about this. I will process a lot of information when this interview is when when this interview is is over. So, how you resolve those questions will be distinctive to you, and as women of color and of diverse backgrounds. So it will reflect your personal and professional experience through your own community and your workplace and your family. So what's essential is that you do answer those questions. So please go through the process of reflecting, reaching out, posting comments, reach out to each other. We've all made new friends here. And what's crucial is that you do go through that process. I'll try not to freeze. Keyshawn, I'll probably call you. <laughs> You go through the process and while enough of us can do just that, over time we will continue having a united front. Transparency and authenticity is the key. We can fundamentally create that transformation. Take your drawbacks, turn it around into something that others find valuable. Give yourselves some grace. Before we leave, I would like to share an excerpt from Dare to Lead by Brene Brown. For those of you who might not know her, she is a number one New York Times bestseller and a TED Talk that has the most view talks in the world on the power of vulnerability. I have to share a quick story with you. So during my burnout, I burnt out. <laughs> and I continued burning out for two weeks. And then I received a link from a phenomenal friend who has impeccable timing. He sends me a link and it's a Tony, I told you this Keyshawn, he sent me a Tony Robbins link. And I thought, Tony Robbins, I listen to him on YouTube. I do the, 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 the medita his meditations in the morning, the breathing exercises for years. When I saw that link, I didn't know what it was. And he said, all he said was check it out. So I did, and he bought me tickets for the Unleash, yes, he did, Maltzin. <laughs> Unleash Power From Within. And when I did it, there were, there were intermittent private chats that were being sent to me. And because I wasn't sharing, they were putting us in Zoom breakout rooms. And I was not sharing. My lips were sealed. And she sent a nice little chat. And she sent me a link to uh, Brene Brown to watch her on TED Talk. I refused to watch her. I didn't watch her until two months later. Then the two months went by. She said bye. Two months went by. And I said, you know, I don't know why she sent me this on vulnerability. So I finally watched it and I realized that I wasn't vulnerable. I was hiding behind the wall. I wasn't sharing for feel for fear of being judged, right? Latanya, you're shaking your head. Yes. So I was not sharing. I was afraid to share and to say what I wanted to say. So in this book, there's an excerpt I want to share with you. And it says at the center of all our elaborate personal 
security measures, and protection schemes lies the most precious treasure of the human experience, which is the heart. In addition to serving as the life-giving muscle that gives blood pumping through our body, it's the universal metaphor for our capacity to love and be loved. And it's symbolic gateway to our emotional lives. That's what I wanted to share with you. And I want to say thank you so much for, for being here with me today. I cannot say enough appreciations. It has been an epic moment for me because it gave me a reason to be vulnerable. <laughs> and thank you all for being here. I want you all to unmute yourselves. You've been muted for a little too long. I want you to use your voice. I see thank your you. hands. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Amazing. So Amazing. So I learned yeah. from everyone. Thank you so yes. much. Absolutely. Oh. Powerful. Powerful. Thank Very. you. Oh, you're welcome. And on that note, it's a sneak little hack on our next episode on uncovering dirty little truths. I won't tell you about what. Stay tuned. Mark your calendars for July 27th at 12 p.m. Eastern time. Thank you again, ladies. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.